seated. Good to be in the Lord's house this morning. Uh, glad to see you here today, especially if you're visiting with us. You're an honored guest. What a good crowd. Uh, hard to believe we had another service already. Amen. It was a wonderful service this morning. Glad to see you here visiting with us today. Thank you so much for coming. Tear out the, the, the deal in your bulletin. Fill that out for me, if you will. Hand it to the guy in the back when you go out. We have a gift for you, uh, for you coming, and we'd love to have a record of your visit, be able to pray for you. So if you'd do that for us, we'd greatly appreciate it. Good to be in the Lord's house. Glad to see you here. Several announcements that I want to share with you. Uh, we will have our men's Bible study tomorrow night at 7 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. Lance Davis is going to be sharing his testimony. Please make plans to come. Men, all of you are invited. If you've never been to one before, please come. Love to have you come and be a part of this, so pray with us about that. Join us if you can uh, this afternoon, the college and career class, and anybody that might be in or around that age group is welcome to go to uh, uh, Carrie and Holly Anderson's camp on the river. They're going to be having a, a celebration, kind of a fall back to back to regular routine, I guess. Not school. Some of them school, some of them career, whatever it is. But 4 o'clock this evening, they're going to have a big time. So anybody wants to go be a part of that, they'd love to have you. Uh, we'll be taking up our Georgia Barnett, Louisiana State Missions offering uh, later in September. Uh, the week of prayer is the 8th through the 15th, so pray with us about that. Uh, also, the fall food roundup for the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home is taking place right now. You can get a list of those things in the foyer, and please bring those things here by September the 15th. Also, on September the 15th, we will begin our revival. I cannot impress on you enough to be here for revival. It's going to be tremendous. One of the good Bible preachers you'll hear, uh, Brother Malcolm Ellis, so honored to have him come. Uh, our, our worship team will be doing Sunday morning both services. He'll be preaching both services. Then Sunday night through Wednesday night, we'll start at 7 o'clock each night. Make a note of that. 7 o'clock Sunday night through Wednesday night. So we're going to look forward to uh, having a big time there. Praying for revival, praying for the Lord to do a great work. We're taking up donation items for David and Kayla Johnson and their family lost their home in a fire last week. And uh, these are the sizes of the things that they need. You can, uh, you can get that out of your bulletin. If you don't have a bulletin, grab it. You'll have one in your hand uh, so you can see the list of things. Please get those things to the church uh, as soon as you can so we can get it to them. If you'd like to make a monetary donation, you can get with us about that, and we'll get that to them also. Shoebox Ministry is, is coming due August 31st, which is this week. So anything that's uh, uh, lacking to be brought in for that, please get those items in uh, for us, and we appreciate all the help. Uh, and all the leadership there, so please do that by the 31st, if you will. Uh, online giving through the QR code in your bulletin. There's an offering plate on the table in the back. We appreciate all of you for doing what you do there. Any other announcement? I feel like an auctioneer. <laughs> Whew. All right. 
Uh, we got a card from the Brokers of Hope. We've partnered with them over a few things uh, in the last few years. They kind of serve in our community of finding out some needs that are in different places uh, and allow the churches to come and be a part of that. So this year we were able to be with them uh, through the school drive, back to school drive, things that they were taking up. And our youth group uh, uh, led out with this, and uh, they sent us a card. Thank you so much for your support, willingness to help in the back to school drive, Brokers of Hope. So we appreciate that. Appreciate them sending that card. All right. Is there nothing else? Huh? Yes, ma'am? Oh, yeah, Miss Lisa's class on Wednesday night, Miss Lisa Kane's class is going to be meeting in Miss Jennifer's Sunday school classroom on Wednesday night back here. So for future reference, starting Wednesday night, if, if any of your kids go or grandkids to this class, they need to come back and, and be in this Sunday school class for their Wednesday night program. All right, thank you. Anything else? All right, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I, I, I know it's uh, the second time, but I'm sure glad to see Ted makes it. Amen. Good to see you, buddy. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. All right. God's good. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for being good to us. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, God, a testimony of answered prayer right here in the building this morning. God, we praise you for that. We ask you, Lord, today that you might just minister to us through song, through sermon. Uh, thank you for this good crowd. Thank you, Lord, for our visitors and guests today. And, Lord, we just... Uh, most importantly, thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we pray today, God, that you will give us the grace uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless these who play instruments and lead us in song. Uh, uh, Lord, thank you for all your many blessings uh, in our life. And God, we pray today for liberty as we preach and as we hear it. God, that we'll receive it with gladness and do what you've told us to do. Have your way today. We're here to worship you. God, we love you. We praise you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing nothing but the blood, page 135. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other bounds I know. Nothing but
Lord, we come to you this morning, and life is worth the living because you live in our hearts this morning, Lord. We just ask that uh, if there's any person here that doesn't have a relationship with you, that doesn't know you, Lord, that doesn't uh, know where their blessings come from, that they might know that before they leave here this morning, that Brother Reuben might share the word that might prick their heart. Um, Lord, what a shame for a person to leave out of here not knowing that you're their Savior. And Lord, we just ask that you would have blessings over this service this morning. You would receive uh, the honor from it, Lord, not, not for us to receive anything but you completely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, sir. If you have your Bible, no. If you have your Bible, open with us to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. Thank you for that awesome praise service this morning. Brother Kevin's out and having had surgery on his eyes and Miss Tiffany and them have been dealing with some sickness and, uh, well, everybody just plugged right in and kept it going. Good to see Brother Charles back up here playing. You know, he had an accident and broke his arm all up. And he's back up there making it happen. Amen. Amen. Appreciate him. Brother, we miss you when you're gone. What a blessing you are. So appreciate that. Luke chapter 14. Stand with us in honor of his word if you can as we read. Luke chapter 14. I always feel sorry for the people who were here doing music in the early service. They have to hear it twice and pretend like it's good. But, uh, amen. It, get, it gets twisted up a little sometimes. It'll be a little bit different. But they just act like they've never heard it before. Amen. Luke chapter 14. We'll start uh, in verse 16. The Bible says, Jesus speaking here, then said he unto him. The Bible says, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. And sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all went, or they all rather, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I have to go and prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those which have been bidden shall taste of my supper. I want to preach a message to you this morning as we look at this parable of our Lord that I've simply titled, What an Invitation. What an Invitation. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you today for loving us. Lord, what a privilege to be able to stand and preach. God, we pray you'd give us freedom to do what you've called us to do. Thank you for the worship service. Thank you, Lord, for how the song stirred our heart. God, I pray now as we open the word and preach that you'd give us grace to say those things that be needful in the lives of all who hear. Pray that your will be done, your son be glorified today, and God, we pray that souls be saved, lives forever changed, and we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, and you can be seated. What an invitation. When you consider the magnitude of this invitation, there are a few things, I suppose by way of introduction, that I'd just like to make note of. One, I want you to think with me about the one who did the inviting. This is what makes this such an incredible invitation. Our Savior. The one who does the inviting. The picture here in the parable is of one who sets a table and invites the en entire multitudes to come to him. Come into my house. A first of course, there was a targeted group, and he sent for that group, and that group made excuse. After making excuse, it says that the Lord of the house was angry, and in his anger, he tells his servant, go out and find all the hurt and broken people, and tell them to come and take their place at my table, and he did. And you hear the heart of the servant when he comes back and says, we did it, they came, but there's still room. And when he said that, the Lord of the house said, well, go back out. Get in the highways and the hedges. Find the people who are hidden in the cracks and crevices of this world 
and bring them into my house. He even uses the word compel them to come into my house. His heart was this, that my house may be filled. What we see in the heart of the Savior is one who desires to welcome all who will come. What an invitation. Not only the Savior that makes this so incredible, but think for just a moment about that servant. That servant who was so willing to go and do his bidding. That servant who was willing to go and call those who would come to come and take a seat at the table. Oh, there's so many things we can say about the servant, but I want to say this, just a few things to make note of, is that this servant can be pictured by the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who comes and deals with our heart. The Holy Spirit who illuminates the Word of God in our mind to show us that you and I, even us, are welcome at the Master's table as He calls us to come and dine. Not only the Holy Spirit, but also the blessed Son of God who came down from heaven, who went to the cross of Calvary, who shed His blood and opened His arms wide to prove to the world that He would welcome all those that would come. This servant that came from God to tell us that any man by blood of Jesus Christ can find his place at the Master's table. But not only that, I want you to think with me about the Holy Scriptures that we have in our hands a Bible that tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. These are the servants that the Lord has sent us to come and tell us that we have a place at the Master's table. Not only the Savior and the servant, but what about the supper? What about the fact that not only were they invited to the table, but the table was set and the spread was ready? When you think about all the things that the Lord has to offer us, it's pretty amazing, isn't it, that God would put all this stuff out and invite us to come. Can I say it again? What an invitation. That God who is such a God, God who is so mighty and so good and so loving and so kind would spread His table and open it up to sinners like me and invite us to come from the brokenness and lowly places of this world and not only have a seat at a table, but His desire is for His house to be filled with people just like you and me who come and respond to such an invitation that we might be a part of the master's table. What a privilege it is to be a part of the family of God. Amen. I want you to notice with me a few things this morning as we consider this text. And I want to say this in light of this invitation. In light of this invitation, something we need here this morning is that we have no excuse. There is no excuse for us today. I love the, the old song that we sing at invitation sometimes, Just As I Am. Without one plea, except that your blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. What, what she was saying when she penned those words is there is absolutely no reason that I would come to your table, except that you shed your blood for me. There's no reason that a person like me would have a place at the master's table, except he invited me to come. Oh, have you ever been to a place where you didn't feel like you belonged? You walked in a place and you didn't feel like maybe you were uh, uh, welcome among the people who were there. Or people looked at you. And have you ever been able to say, hey, I was invited. Amen. You look at me however you want to. I might not dress like you. I might not walk like you or talk like you or look like you or, or smell like you. Amen. But I was invited. And you're not taking my seat at the table because I know the one who did the end. Come on now. I know the one who said I could come. And if Jesus said I could come, I can walk on water to get there. If Jesus said I can come, I can go through. The, come on now, I can walk through the fire. If Jesus said I can come, I can come, amen. I've got a place at the table because Jesus invited me. What an invitation. What an invitation. Number one, I want you to see this. We have no excuse to not be his. We have no excuse to not belong to Jesus. There is no reason whatsoever that we're not one of His because we've been invited by the Lord. Can I say this? It was the purpose of our creation. All this talk in politics today about the right to life and to live and all these things, can I just say to you that life, human life, has one purpose and that is to fellowship with and glorify God. Every human life has been given to fellowship with and glorify God. Now, now let me tell you where the waters got muddied is when Adam and Eve decided they were going to do what the devil said. <laughs> Amen? And we've muddied the waters ourselves, have we not? By doing the things we know we shouldn't have done. But sin crept in and it complicated the whole issue. But let me tell you this. Not only do we see the purpose of our creation in that God created us, He said, in His own image. 
And then that image got distorted by sin. He sent His Son to come die for that sin and wash us clean so that we again might be used to be the image, whew, the image of the Most High God. The purpose of our creation, and if you want to side note that, the, the purpose of our recreation is the same intent. So that we can fellowship with and glorify God. We have no excuse this morning not to be His. We have no excuse not to be a child of God. The purpose of our creation, the power of His cross. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross will set you free. We have a place in the cross of Calvary this morning. The cross of Calvary is our invitation. The blood of Jesus is our invitation. It shows us that any man, whosoever, the Bible says, that whosoever shall call upon him shall be saved. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That any man, woman, boy, or girl that comes by way of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and receives the free gift of his grace will be born into the family of God. And I'm saying because of everything that God did, because of everything his spirit did, because of everything his son did, because of everything his word says, you and I don't have an excuse this morning to die without Christ. We should be His this morning because of the purpose of our creation, the power of His cross, and the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, the Bible said, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We have the Spirit of God today, not only to save us, but to seal us, to help us, to hold us, to minister to us, to walk through this life with us, and give us the privilege to sit in heavenly place. You don't have an excuse this morning. If you walk out of here without Jesus, it's on you. Amen. There's not going to be anybody who stands before God one day and able to say, listen, I would have got saved, but you didn't tell me. I would have got saved. Listen, there's enough in creation to declare, the Bible says, the glory of God. Even for those who've never heard the gospel with their ear, they've seen it with their eyes. Every fall we see death. Every spring we see new life. When that sun comes up every morning and the birds start singing His praises and the winds blow and the clouds part and the sky, you can see God everywhere you look. Amen. Except the news. Except TikTok. Amen? You can find Him on there if you'll look in the right places. But the reality is, is there is for certain an enemy. Can I say this? Nobody ever plays defense if they're not worried about the offense. So, so don't listen to me. For, for, for the group on the other side, no one leans against a wall they don't believe is there. Because if you lean against something that doesn't exist, you fall flat on your face. They preach a gospel just like we do. The only pro problem is their gospel is empty. And our gospel is full of the Holy Ghost of God and the precious, exceeding, abundant promises of Scripture. We have in our hands today the very written Word of God and from the Holy Spirit, the very spoken Word of God to remind me and you that not one soul that's ever drawn breath will stand before God with an excuse as to why they'd never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. There is an invitation. Do you hear me? <laughs> what an invitation. That he would go so far as to go after his people, the apple of his eye. But John pens this in John chapter 1. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For the Jew first, and then unto the Gentile. See, he called this particular group who he had separated by his own name and he invited them to come. And one by one by one, the excuses came. I can't come because of this. I can't come because of that. And the anger of the Lord of the house was kindled. And he looked at his servant. And for you and me today, we better praise God. He looked at his servant and he said, then go get whoever will come. Go get the ones who are broken, who are dirty, who are filthy, who are maimed, who are blind, and bring them to my house. And the servant came and got us. Amen? In the book of Acts, you see the gospel of the kingdom of God preached all the way up until Acts chapter 7 when Stephen preaches the gospel of the kingdom and gets stoned to death and Jesus received him standing at the right hand of the Father. Oh, but in Acts chapter 8, we saw something that blew the minds of the entire world, especially the whole group at Jerusalem, and that was an Ethiopian eunuch 
rides into town, reads a scroll, scroll of Isaiah 53, and another spirit-filled deacon named Philip joins himself to his chariot, wins him to the Lord. You have a eunuch saved from Ethiopia in chapter 8. You have a Benjamite saved in Saul of Tarsus in chapter 9. And then you've got Cornelius saved in Acts chapter 10. Shem, Ham, and Japheth all represented in these three people which showed us that the door had been blown wide open and whosoever would come to this table had a seat if they would just answer answer that invitation what an invitation that we can come you've got a seat it's got your name on it what you don't have this morning is an excuse as to why you can't come to Christ and be saved we don't have an excuse not to be his we don't have an excuse not to be a excuse me not to be holy not to be holy now this word's funny because as soon as I said it you deflated because that's not exciting we love to be saved that sanctified part's not a lot of fun. You, you, you can get somebody saved and, and have a big celebration. You get somebody saved and we'll baptize them and we'll put that on Facebook and hallelujah. What you can't put in a Facebook post is sanctification. What you can't encapsulate in, in a few characters and a couple of pictures or maybe a video is holiness. Because holiness is a journey. And if you're like me, holiness is an interesting thing. And nobody just kind of pops up from their salvation and starts getting holy. Like it's kind of a process that you have to go through. And what's interesting is that process begins. It starts when we come to Him. When we come to Christ, that's when holiness has its opportunity to begin. So we come to Christ for what? And when we come in salvation, there's two things that immediately transpire. One, we receive forgiveness of our sin and we have faith. Forgiveness and faith come at salvation. And so with salvation, we now have forgiveness. We now have faith. But then there's something else. Not only does it start when we come to Him, but it sustains in our life when we stay near Him. Yes. Talking about holiness. Talking about our sanctification. It, it stays with us when we stay with Him. Jesus said in John 15, If you abide in me and my word abides in you, then you will bear much fruit. <laughs> so as we walk with the Lord. As we go through this life together, like the old song says, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own. But if you're like me, there's been seasons in your life, you, you're kind of like a pinball. <laughs> I'm over here with Jesus, whoop, whoop, everything's going good. And we got our Sunday selfies and everything going right. And then boom, I'm over here. The world got me. And I stumbled. And I got off into something I shouldn't have. Or I thought what I shouldn't. And I went where I shouldn't. And then I got guilty. And then I felt the shame. And then I didn't want to. In my heart I wanted to be back. But I scared to face the Lord. I scared to face. And then ping pong. Whoo, back over here. I finally got it right. There was tears. Maybe an altar call. God moved in my life. I'm back walking with the Lord. I'm walking with the Lord. And see there's something that comes when we walk through that experience. It's kind of like being on a treadmill. You, you can run real fast. And, and you can run real hard. But you're not going anywhere. <laughs> And as long as you're pinging back and forth between the Lord and the world, you're going to stay in this place. But if you ever get a hold of this, that for us to be sustained in our holiness, our walk with God, we're going to have to stay with Him. We're going to have to be faithful. That means you're going to have to get up and come to church when you don't feel like it. Amen? Amen. Amen. That, that means you're going to have to make some sacrifices to serve the Lord. That means when you want to get even, you can't do it. Amen? That means when your wife does something wrong, and if mine ever does, I'll get her. <laughs> Amen? You can't blow a top and throw a fit every time. So You've got to be able to find your place in the Lord. And as we walk through this, we learn how to do that. As we work for the Lord, it gives us the tools to be holy. It gives us the tools. Don't, don't think when I say holy, you know, we talk about people that are holier than thou or self-righteous, and you think about holiness, somebody with a robe on and doing the meditation, and all that stuff. Get over that part. I'm talking about being distinguishable. That's what holiness is. Holiness is being able to see somebody and know who they belong to. Somebody that can be identifiably his. It starts when you come to him. It sustains when you stay near him, but it summons when you look like him. And that's the point. And it takes us a long time to get there. But my, 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 when you do, God can use you to do things you never imagined for your family, for your friends, for your church, for your enemies, when you walk with the Lord, when you strive to be holy.
when you have a desire to be like Jesus, when we want to look like Jesus. So how does one look like Jesus? I'm going to say this. Christ-like character. I'm not going to tell you to look like Jesus. You need to have a good beard and long hair and a pretty face and good skin and, and the long robe and like they see every picture and every television film. I don't think anybody's ever come close to what he really looks like. I just don't believe it. And most of them, he's a Caucasian. He's the only white guy in Israel in, in 2,000 years ago. <laughs> he's just walking around. No wonder they followed him. They ain't never seen nothing like that. He's, <laughs> he's just, just walking around speaking English right there in Israel. Just Hello, everybody. It's white Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I like what Billy Graham said. It's not a white people gospel. It's not a black people gospel. It's an every man yeah, right. gospel. And he's an every man Lord. And we thank God for that today. I don't know what Jesus looked like physically, though I will one day, and I don't think it'll be anything like we depict in our minds. But I know what he looked like character-wise. He was forgiven. He was kind. He was patient. You know what I've learned in my walk with Jesus and my work for the Lord is that he's so much different than most religious people. Most religious people are waiting on an opportunity to out you for your sin. And it really seems like he goes out of his way to look for a reason. To help you in it. Amen. That's been my experience. I, I used to preach because I used to hear it like this and, and receive, not because of the way it was preached to me, but just the way I felt it. I think the, the religious faculties are, are more receptive to the doom and gloom. And I used to look for lightning bolts to strike people all the time. You know, I was that kind of religious. I, I thought, you know, you say a bad word. <laughs> huh? huh? And listen, I believe in the judgment of God. I believe in the discipline, the chastening of the Lord. I, I believe that wholeheartedly. But I know at least when I've had to discipline my children, it, it always came with a compliment of love and understanding for what we just went through together. And in my experience with the Lord, probably the greatest discipline he's ever exercised in my life has just been letting me feel the blunt of knowing that I disappointed my father. That hurts me worse than if he took me out behind the woodshed. Because I can understand why he would take me out behind the woodshed. I could understand why the lightning bolt would have hit me a long time ago. I can't preach that no more because I can give him too many reasons. <laughs> if I really believed that, I got struck down a long, long, long time ago. Amen. I'm just telling you he's patient and he's long-suffering and he's merciful. And it's high time people that go to church and say they love the Lord acted like that too. That means if somebody messes up your order, if somebody doesn't please you, if you don't get the best customer service experience, hush. Amen. Be kind, be sweet, be forgiven. Have you ever thought that maybe your car hop did not have a good day either? <coughs> have you ever thought that maybe the person that, that helped you with something that went wrong or disappointed you or didn't provide service, maybe they're having trouble at home. Maybe they're, you know, there used to be an expression uh, that waiters and waitresses said in their own circle about Christian people when they came in the restaurant that when their heads went down, so did the tips. It ought not be that way. We ought to be the most generous, loving people that ever was. I'm talking about blessing people. I ain't saying go goofy and give your life savings away. What I am saying is trust the Lord enough to be better to people than they deserve. And if you need a picture of that, open this book. That's exactly what he's been to you and me. I'm talking about Christ-like character. That, that's when holiness reaches its summit. Is when the people of God start to look like the God of the people. And that's kind, patient, loving, forgiveness, welcoming. But it's also truth. It's not beyond the bounds of telling the truth. But it's learning how to tell the truth like Jesus and not with judgment. And the reason is, is because there's never been a time in my life that I was so pure that I could judge you without something in my own life to be judged. And Jesus speaks on that in Matthew 7 when he says, Judge not lest you be judged, because for the manner in which you judge, that's how it's going to be measured back to you. So what you need to do before you go helping somebody else with their sin is help your own self. Amen? Get on right here before you get out your underwear. Come on. That's why we have altar call and invitation because I don't want to send you out of here dirty. I don't want to send you out of here lost. I want to send us out of here clean and fit for the kingdom. So let's go. That's why we do this. Every, somebody told me one time, I'm going to come see you one Sunday. I said, you ain't going to do it. I've been here 11 years. You ain't come yet. I said, but I'll tell you this. We do it every Sunday. Amen. So come on down. That, that's why we do it every Sunday. Why? Because we need it. <laughs> Amen. Come in here and get our mind right, our heart right, get clean, get prepared, get full of the Holy Spirit, and go back out there on the battlefield and love this world like Jesus. That's Christ-like character. You and I don't have an excuse this morning not to be holy because he prepared a table for us 
And he sent us an invitation. Come and walk with me. Come and be near me. Come and look like me. And go out into the world and do the work that I've called you to do. We don't have an excuse not to be his. We don't have an excuse not to be holy. And listen to this. Wednesday night, I, I've listened to some different things through the political channels and all the stuff they've been talking about. And, you know, they're using these buzzwords now. All these buzzwords. And you can tell that they all get together and say, use these certain words because they push buttons with people. And, of course, you all heard about everybody being weird. We heard that for weeks. And then I noticed last week the word was hope. It's all about hope. Hope, 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 hope. So Wednesday night, I just came in here and we had a time more of a Bible study than a message, but, but just a, a fleshing out of the biblical narrative of hope. How do we have hope? And we just kind of plowed through Scripture. And we talked about several ways that we have hope through Scripture and in God. And we talked about hope. And when talking about that, I made the statement that I was involved in a radio ministry years ago, and a good friend of mine and I were helping with this, and, and we were putting messages out in over 100 countries and all over the nation, and, and, and people were hearing the gospel through these radio broadcasts, and it was amazing. But they had the, the ability to go back and re-listen to the sermons online or to request CDs or, or whatever it was of those sermons, and one sermon that got more than triple of the response than even the second sermon in the whole series of messages that we put out was a message my friend and Jerry Chaddock preached on how to be happy because the title of that sermon pricked the hearts of people who are not happy and so I want to say to you in the message this morning when I say again what an invitation he, he's inviting us to be his he's inviting us to be holy and he's inviting us to be happy and we ought to be happy this morning. Oh, we used to sing in church camp, since Jesus Christ came in and saved my soul from sin. I'm in right up, right out, right down, right however. Went happy all the time. And, and we talked about the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. And I think somewhere along the way we thought that was where it was cataloged and we couldn't let it get to our face. <laughs> down in my heart to stay. <laughs> But I like the next verse. If the devil don't like it, he can sit on a tack. Ouch! I've been sharpening that tack for 40 years. Amen? I want to get him good. Come on. I'm saying to you this morning that we don't have an excuse not to be happy. I, I looked this up between the early service and this one, so for anybody who didn't hear this this morning, forgive me, I just got a hold of this during the Sunday school hour. 540 million times a year. People Google this question, how to be happy. There are only 346 million, slightly less, people in the United States of America. 540 million people a year, how to be happy. It really hits us, doesn't it? There are people in this room, you ever watch television and go to the commercials? All those commercials are about is how to make you happy. If you're depressed, make you happy. If you're fat, make you skinny. If, you, if you're deprived in any amount of pleasure in your life, there's a pill for that too. Amen? I mean, they got something for everybody. We want you to be happy, happy, happy. That's what everybody wants. Take this pill. Order this drug. Do this thing. Everything's about making you better, making you happy, giving you some more appreciable amount of happiness in your life. And I want to say to you as a child of God that you and I this morning do not have an excuse not to be happy because we've been invited to be happy in Jesus. Now let me tell you a few things about Scripture uh, that talks about happiness. Let me tell you what it is that gives us happiness. Real, lasting happiness in our life. You ready for this? The first one is a testimony. The Bible says in Acts chapter 26 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul has been beaten, he's been stoned, he's been imprisoned, he's been through every imaginable, he got shipwrecked, I mean, you're talking about natural, he got shipwrecked, bit by a snake, <laughs> I mean, it's like, so you had a bad day, right? I mean, everything that could go, Murphy's Law, everything that could go wrong went wrong. He gets arrested and put on trial. He has to go before all of these different authorities. And then he's brought up to stand before Agrippa and this multitude of people in judgment who are looking upon him, this man who, who has Roman and Jewish descent but is now converted to Christianity. And here he stands with broken bones and scabs and, and, and blood stains and all the things, chains on his hands and on his feet, and they bring him out to plead his case. Now, I, I'd like to say that I would have done what Paul did. Chances are, I would have probably took my chance to say, how is this fair? When all I've done is try to love you and plant churches for you and lead you to Christ and give you something good. He could have stood his ground and argued his position and done everything he could to defend his own life, yet he chose 
to just tell that story one more time of what Jesus Christ had done for him. And he opened with this infamous saying as he stands. Here's this multitude of high to do, royalty, rich, crooked, political, name it. They had it all surrounding him. As they looked down condescendingly on this broken, beaten, bruised apostle. And he says to them, I think myself happy. And then he goes into great detail about what Jesus Christ did to him on the road to Damascus when he entered into his life and saved his wretched soul and gave him the privilege to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I don't care what you do to me. I don't care what happens to me. I don't care if this is where it ends. What you cannot take from me is what Jesus did for me, and that's enough to make me happy this morning. And I'm saying to you this morning, we have the privilege to stand in a day of political uncertainty, in a day of absolute chaos, financial calamity, there's sickness abounding, and there's craziness up and down our streets. But we as the people of God have the reserved right to stand even with tear-stained cheeks and trembling lips and fluttering heartbeats and say, I'm happy in Jesus because of what He's done, because I've got a testimony. Can I ask you this morning, do you? Do you have a testimony this morning that will help you stay happy even in the face of failure, in the face of hurt, in the face of disaster and calamity? Can you still say, I'm happy in Jesus Christ because of what He's done for me? My grandparents down at Pleasant Hill lived in what was called a Jim Walter home. Little old prefab wood frame house put together. Two bedrooms, one bathroom. Other family members had nice homes and nice places. But when we got together, we went there because that place was filled with love. It was filled with happiness. They got married when they were 16 and 17 years old. Have you ever? <laughs> 16 and 17 years old, they got married. Went to work, share cropping, picking cotton, doing all that. Yeah, yeah, picking cotton's a cultural thing. Amen? All our poor folks pick cotton. That, that don't discriminate against anybody. You got family that picked it too. Amen? I mean, that's just what they had to do. They, they, they lived the hard life, but they loved the Lord and they loved their family. And no matter what they faced, there was happiness in their home. I don't know what that's called, but I want it. Amen? That kind of happiness. We don't have an excuse not to be happy. I've stood in the place with people as they said goodbye to their loved ones. I've stood around uh, uh, dead bodies as we've wept over their loss. And I've still seen the joy of the Lord in the lives and in the hearts of people. That's that happiness that we don't have to live without. I, I can get diagnosed with cancer tomorrow and still be happy. I can get met with tragedy tomorrow and still be It don't mean we don't mourn. It don't mean we don't hurt. It don't mean we don't suffer. It just means that Jesus has done so much for me that no matter what this world can deal out and throw at me, I've still got happiness because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. Do you have that this morning? Because he's given you an invitation. He set the table. And when the first group was too ignorant to receive it, he sent the Holy Scripture and the Holy Spirit and the blessed Son of God to come and tell people just like me and you that we have a place at the, <laughs> a place at the Master's table. He's happy because he had a testimony. I'll tell you how else you can be happy. Is have a faith that endures. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 144 and verse 15, happy is the people whose God is the Lord. James writes in James 5, 11, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Those who are able to fight the good fight. You, you know what's interesting? In my time in ministry, I, I've, I've been around a lot of people. I've been around all age groups. I've watched all these different people. But I'm going to tell you, there's something to be appreciated about those senior adults who have stayed faithful, who have stayed in church, who have trusted the Lord. And what's interesting about some of y'all, and it tickles me, is the things that would bother, and not, not that I'm in the young, I'm in this weird paradox where I can't be young or old. Young people think I'm old, old people think I'm young, so I'm just stuck in this weird place, so whatever I say is wrong. But <laughs> to, to watch the older people see stuff coming at us, and they're not really that bothered by it. Oh, it hurts their heart. And they might get mad if you get their seat. You know what I'm saying? Or their parking spot. Or if the thermostat's not right. That might anger them. But knowing that God's going to take care of us comes a little more naturally to them. You know why that is? Because they've seen it. They've seen it. 
I heard people saying one time when uh, people were talking about having kids, they said, oh, this is a bad time to have kids. I dare you to tell me when was a good time. I'm studying the history of our country. I'm serious. Name me one decade that there wasn't plenty of reason not to have a kid. That there wasn't a Cold War or a nuclear threat or Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam or Korea or World War II or World War I or, by the way, in between those, ah, Great Depression. <laughs> they was actually selling kids. I didn't know you tried it in COVID, but it didn't work. <laughs> that seven months of summer, <laughs> I'm still mad about that. I'm over there educating the kids. Teachers was eating honey buns and getting the check. I'm like, well, something ain't right about this. These educators, I'm telling you, payday someday. Hey, man, I ain't got a dime of that money. I'm over here just teaching kids. That's what, Anyway, we'll get to that. They'll be taking remedial college classes because of that six months. <laughs> we was doing the wheels on the bus going around. <laughs> I'm like, Daddy, we're 12. <laughs> People who've endured some stuff, they understand that they can be happy because God's going to take care of his people. That's what the psalmist said in Psalms 37. I, I, I've been old, and, or young rather, now I'm old. But I hadn't seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. What are you saying? I'm saying you don't have an excuse not to be happy. Well, what, what, what about this election? I'm going to be happy. I don't have to be happy with politics to be happy in Jesus. What, what, what about the deficit? I'm going to be dead before they pay it off anyway, even if they got it figured out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they line that out, we all going to be dead. That'll be somebody else's money. They can deal with that. What, 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 what about all, I ain't worried about that we can't let that stuff overshadow what God has done for us we can't let the temporal override the eternal we have hope in Jesus Christ I got a home in heaven that's what gives somebody the resolve to say well, Paul, if I live it's Christ if I die it's gain if I live I'm going to live for Jesus if I die I'm going to be with him you can't stop me player when I get like that it's over you can't do nothing with somebody in that position. There's nothing you... So kill me. I'm going home. If you don't kill me, I'm finna give it to you again. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. I don't care if you like it or not. Amen. <sighs> so tired of all this worrying and fretting. We ought to be happy. We ought to be... I'm gonna go, we ought not just be happy. We ought to be so happy they want to put us on something. <laughs> Try to take it down a notch. We ought to be the happiest people in the world. I mean, we ought to be... Big Swirl. Y'all know about Big Swirl? That makes me happy. Amen? <laughs> Check it out sometime. I'm just saying to you, we have the privilege, when there's no reason to be happy, to be happy. Because we have a faith that endures. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Not only to have a testimony or a faith that endures, but to have a triumph over suffering. I'm talking about us being happy. Listen to this. Peter writes to a group of people who've been separated and they've been scattered. Now what you'll find if you study this and looking back from an historical lens is that what God did was allowed persecution to come in to broadcast the gospel. Because if it's one thing we know about us, we don't tend to get off center unless we're made. <laughs> we we, we, we kind of like to hunker down, amen? We like to find the sweet spot and stay there. We like to get in the good and just, just exhaust it and just let somebody else deal with the outcome. So sometimes God has to allow a pressing in our life to force us out of our comfort. And that's what happened to the early church. God allowed persecution. Persecution came in and it scattered them abroad. Now from their standpoint, it probably would have sounded like a very tragic event and a very sad thing. But in a historical standpoint, what it did was it broadcast the gospel into the outer regions so that the gospel could continue on to grow and reach others and continue on to do that until it jumped the pond and made it here. And here we are as a result of that. So praise the Lord for that. But Peter, writing to that group of people who were suffering from persecution, probably discouraged, probably disheartened, Peter writes these words. But and if you suffer, he said, for righteousness sake, happy are you. That don't make sense. You're happy because you're suffering. Peter said, if you're suffering for Jesus, you are. There ought not be anything that makes us happier than to know that if we got to go through something, we're going through it for the Lord. We're going through it for the right. That old song they used to sing, if you're in the battle for the Lord and right, Keep on the firing line. Keep doing what God has called us to do. So just to wrap this up, let me ask you this question. We don't have an excuse not to be his, not to be holy, not to be happy. We actually have an invitation to come to the table and receive those things. Can I ask you this? Have you? And what's your excuse? What's kept you from God? 
Why aren't you saved? <laughs> and if you're not saved, why wouldn't you be saved? And if you are saved, why wouldn't you live your life for Christ? Why wouldn't you put Jesus first? Do you want to be happy? Then you're going to have to be His. And you're going to have to be holy. But when you come to Christ and you walk with Him, what you'll find is there's no more happiness in this world than walking with Jesus and getting to spend that precious time with Him. And we don't have an excuse today not to be. Listen to this. The Lord set a table. He sent a messenger to tell us this morning that we could come. What an invitation. But listen to the warning. He says at the conclusion of the parable, none of those which were invited who turned him away were going to taste of his supper. You know, the New Testament talks about those of you who have tasted grace. And I can tell you this morning that it's good. But a verse that I love in Psalm 34, 8, kind of my theme for McRib season. <laughs> the psalmist said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord, he is good. Can I say to you this morning, if you don't know, it's on you. There's a group in Matthew 7 who tells the Lord at the judgment, we did it all. We even did it in your name. We preached. We taught. We prophesied. We cast out demons. Jesus looked at them very bluntly and said, Depart from me, you who work iniquity, for I never knew you. How could it be that somebody doing something that seems good could be called iniquity. The proverb says in Proverbs 15, 8, that the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination unto God. God doesn't want what you bring to the table. He wants you. And then when he's got you, he'll give you what he wants you to have. You might be a, a very talented person with great ability. God don't need you. God don't need me. The overwhelming truth is, he wants me. So much so that he set a table and sent me an invitation and told me that I could come. The Lord told me I could be. I, I love the story. Alistair Begg gave this illustration about the thief on the cross. Of course, you've got to have that good accent, and I don't have it. But he said the thief on the cross, when he died, he got to heaven. And everybody looked at him in astonishment. <laughs> How in the world did you get here? I said, one asked him, what church did you belong to? He said, I never went to church. I said, well, what water were you baptized? He said, I never got baptized. Well, surely you took the sacraments. He said, no, I never took communion. And they said, well, how did you get here? He said, the man on the middle cross told me I could come. I'm here to tell you this morning, that same man on that middle cross said you could come too. And because of that, you don't have an excuse not to. You need to be his. You need to be holy. And then you can be happy in Jesus. And there's only one way the hymnist said to be happy in Jesus is to trust and obey. No other way. I'm here because he said I could be here. And I got good news for you, beloved. He said you can come too. Come on. Let's stand. Father, thank you today for loving us. Thank you for your grace. What an invitation. Mm. Lord, I'm glad today that I can say that I'm yours. And God, I'm glad today that you love me enough to discipline me and stay after me and you persist in my life to drive me towards holiness. And I thank you for that. Because this world don't need more Reuben. This world needs more Jesus. And I'm glad, Lord, when I find that and I live my life as a believer, walking and working for Jesus Christ, that in the face of whatever this world or this life deals me, I can have happiness. And Lord, I pray today for people who struggle with that happiness. Lord, for people who have rebelled from that holiness, from people who have rejected that offering of salvation, God, let them see two things today. They have an official invitation from the master of the table. And they don't have an excuse not to come. 
So, Lord, I pray this morning that for anyone who may need to be saved, that they'd come get it settled once and for all. Lord, for anybody here who's saved but hadn't been walking as they should, what a blessing it is to know that we have the privilege to repent and get right and walk out of here ready to do what you've called us to do. Lord, for that one in here today who has struggled with depression, with anxiety, Lord, with the weight of this world that seems to constantly rob them of the happiness, I pray that they see, Lord, that our happiness is not found in the things of this world or the prosperity of this world, but our happiness is found in a testimony that tells us we belong to Jesus in a faith that endures to the end. And, Lord, that even in the face of suffering, we can count ourselves happy. So happy that we read where one pair actually sat in a jail cell, chained together, beaten and bruised for planting the church and winning souls. And yet they at midnight woke up, started praying and praising God. That's the kind of happiness, Lord, I pray that our people can have. Happiness that can't be found in the bottom of a bottle. Happiness that can't be found in pleasures of this world but happiness that can be found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to receive that invitation with gladness and come because you said we could come. Bless this invitation. Your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come find your place in this altar if you need to pray this morning. Maybe you just need to repent. Maybe you need to be saved. Maybe you need to pray for God to restore your joy. And your